From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It is 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day on this Wednesday, June 1st. Here are the top market stories we're following for you at this hour. Let the QT begin. The Fed starts shrinking its massive balance sheet today. It's a runoff versus tightening. We're look for where strains in the financial markets may appear. And finding deep value, Howard Marks of Oak Tree sees opportunities in growth as well as India and China. More from our exclusive interview with the legendary investor. And jolting the jobs market. The latest read on hiring, inflation and manufacturing with Tim Fiore, chair of ISM's Manufacturing Business Survey Committee. From New York. I'm Alex Steele, my co-host in London, Anna Edwards. Guy Johnson is off today. Welcome, everyone, uh, to Bloomberg Markets. First day of June, equities on the front foot, economic data front and center. Yeah, econ uh, economic data front and center. European markets struggling to find much direction, although U.S. markets giving a, a little bit of that. But it is a bit varied. It doesn't feel uh, as if perhaps there's all that much commitment behind it because we're quite low on volumes here in Europe. So we'll return to that theme. Let's get to some of that economic data that Alex was just mentioning. And we'll go first to the jolts jolting the U.S. economy. See what you did there, Alex, in the, uh, in the headlines <laughs> like that. So um, we've got jolts job openings coming in at 11,400. 11, so that's 11.4 million essentially and that is pr almost in line with what we were expecting 11.35 million was what we were expecting it's down a little bit on the prior period but it is more than the survey and if this is part of the continual recovery in the jobs picture in the United States then we're certainly still seeing that we got down to levels of around 5 million back in 2020 a lot of people starting to ask questions when do we get more job openings in the US economy than we have uh, the, the, than we have unemployed people in the US economy we certainly got to that particular landmark uh, if Event here in the UK some time ago. So interesting to keep an eye on the tightness of this labor market right now, Alex. All right, here in the US, you got the ISM. Uh, manufacturing, prices paid, new orders all coming in stronger than estimated, particularly the new orders uh, coming in there at 55.1 and the manufacturing index coming in over 56. The one lighter area, though, that missed estimates a touch is ISM employment coming in under 50, which is usually that expansionary mark. Uh, equities, though, not reacting that much at all. You still have S&P up by about four tenths of 1%. Let's dig into the numbers here. Because the question really becomes, what kind of demand destruction do we see from higher inflation? That's what the Fed's watching. That's what markets are going to be watching. want to bring in Tim Fiore, chair of the ISM's Manufacturing Business Survey Committee. Hey, Tim, it's great to see you. What was your biggest takeaway from the ISM today? Well, not to avoid the employment number, which we'll get to shortly, I think the, the greatest news here is that the demand, after softening slightly in April, bounced right back. And all four sub-indexes that I use to track demand all reacted positively. The customer inventory number, the, uh, the backlog number, particularly new export order was a little bit soft, but not a big surprise at Europe and China, and, uh, and the new order number popping up. So it feels good. I mean, the sentiment of the panel was five to one positive about future demand, which is, which is you know, makes you feel real good. So I think demand is, is stable, solid. Uh, there was a little bit of concern in the April timeframe, uh, but it seems to be rectified. But there are some signs in some industry sectors that we're seeing a little bit of slowing and expansion, primarily in those sectors that support the building industry. We had comments from mm. the chemical industry sectors and uh, fabricated metal products and non-metallic materials where there's some indication of some softening, not, not a big surprise. Timothy, good morning. Let, let me ask you about that a little bit more then, because you, you, from what you said at the beginning, it sounded as if any weakness was coming from overseas, uh, and actually the U.S. dimension here was really strong, but then there is maybe some weakness in construction. Talk us through, through that a little more. Right. So, uh, so I, I go through the comments and I look for people feeling that things are slowing a bit. It's, it's time to start to look for that because at some point it will happen. And uh, I, you know, I came up with slightly less than ten percent of the general comments indicating that things may be slowing, not things are slowing. So there's 18 industry sectors that make up the manufacturing economy. I looked into those, and there were three that kind of stood out: metallic materials. That's a big building construction area. Chemical products. It's a foundation element that goes into a lot of other materials and fabricated metal products, but that does the same. So, I mean, it's not widespread. It seems to be industry specific. And I guess not that big of a surprise given what's happening now with the housing market. Yeah, Tim, I wanted to get your take on that. Is it more of a supply issue, right? We don't have the construction material to build the stuff or is it an underlying demand issue? Well, the indications were it's demand, but it could also be that there's over ordering and that people have you know, really pumped up the, uh, the, the purchase order pipeline over the last year 
to account for long lead times. We're still sitting at record lead times. It hasn't budged. Uh, you did see that the price index eased a little bit, which is a positive sign. And our supplier delivery index came off a little bit too, which is a positive sign, but we're not seeing dramatic movements in those. We're seeing slow and steady improvement, you know, post, uh, post uh, the Russia invasion of Ukraine. So, you know, we're moving in the right direction here, but uh, it's going to be yeah. slow. And, you know, let's get to the employment numbers. So we did contract, not a really big surprise. We're, you know, we're dealing with very significant quits. It seems to be slowing a little bit, but not very much. And uh, although our panelist companies are getting better at hiring people, they're still losing people. Uh, as you saw just recently, I think we set records in the month of uh, April, I think it was. So that's still continuing. Uh, there's still a chase for wages. And you know, until that employment number really comes back, our production number isn't going to get into that high 50s that we're really looking for. OK. And let me ask you about any clues you've got for us, Timothy, around inflation. Uh, looking at the prices paid component here, the actual number coming in at 82, above the survey, but lower than the prior period. Any clues as to where the inflation narrative goes? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's in transportation, it's in energy for sure. Uh, there seems to be some topping off. We just recently did our forecast for the second half of the year, and we're feeling that the, the prices are up about 11.4% compared to December of last year. But we believe by the end of the year, it'll be up 11.1%. So that kind of indicates that we're at the peak of growth and that we'll have a slow come down, not even, you know, 100 basis points here, but we'll come down slightly as we close on the year, which means that we're moving more towards equilibrium. I think it's, uh, you know, I think this is a really strong month. Uh, at this point in our 24 month manufacturing expansion cycle, it's really positive. As I've mentioned before, uh, our, our typical cycles are about 34 months. I, I feel that this one will be longer. Uh, if, if the Fed doesn't do something on the interest rate side next year, that could slow it down faster. But I think we're in a great trajectory here. There's still a lot of demand out there. Supply chain is getting better. And you can see it with some of the sub indexes, we're still struggling with conversion. And that's primarily due to labor issues on the factory floor, which is driven really by the quits that are. Hey, Tim, um, maybe an unfair question, but if the Fed looks at this number, is this the kind of number where they're like, OK, great, economy is good enough, but demand's too strong still. We're going to have to hike a lot more than just 250 basis point hikes over the next uh, few months. Well, you know, I can't speak for that, but sitting, sitting at 1% federal funds rate is still really low. I mean, it's a long way to go towards what is, is equilibrium. So I, I don't think that they would be disappointed in this number. I don't, it's, it doesn't feel like it's an overheating number. And it doesn't feel like it's it's collapsing towards the 50 level. So, I mean, if we ran 55 to 58 for the next six to nine months, that would be really good. I mean, every two and a half bit, uh, points here in, in the PMI is approximately eight to 10 percent improvement month over month. So, you know, we're doing you know much better than April. Timothy, thanks very much for joining us. Good to speak to you. Timothy Fiore, uh, Chair for the ISM Manufacturing Business Survey Committee. Let's get to some other breaking news we've had just in the last few minutes, and that comes to us from Bank of Canada. Of course, we're monitoring rate hikes across the globe, as that seems to be the, the dominant narrative, not in China, of course, but uh, many other places. Bank of Canada hikes key policy rates by 50 basis points to 1.5%. They're warning another red headline tells me that the Bank of Canada is warning it could be even more forceful if needed. And there was going to be a lot of focus on the hawkishness or otherwise of the statement. This is the second jumbo hike we've had from the Bank of Canada. Another one is currently due in July. That would be a third. Do they pause after that? How will the market in interpret that more forceful if needed? Does that mean could do more than 50? I mean, 50 is what they've done twice and an expectation in the markets that they will do another 50 shortly. Uh, so this is what we see in the FX markets as a result. The loonie maintaining its gain after the Bank of Canada policy decision. Now, coming up on this program, the Fed has another tool to fight inflation. It's shrinking its $8.9 trillion balance sheet. That starts today. Where are the biggest risks from quantitative tightening? We're going to ask Lisa Shallett from Morgan Stanley Wealth Management, where she's Chief Investment Officer. That conversation coming up next. This is Bloomberg. The labor market is the tightest basically it's ever been, and you can see that by the ratio of unfilled jobs relative to the number of people that are unemployed. The Fed needs to loosen that up or wage pressures will accumulate, and that will keep inflation above the Fed's 2% inflation objective.
That was Bill Dudley, Bloomberg opinion columnist and former New York Fed president, of course, speaking earlier on Bloomberg TV. Let's get to our question of the day. Where is the biggest risk from QT, from quantitative tightening, from the runoff of these balance sheets that we see starting today at the Fed, but actually has been taking place from other global central banks already? Lisa Shallot joins us, Morgan Stanley Wealth Management Chief Investment Officer. Lisa, really nice to have you with us. Uh, let's start on this question then about QT, because it starts today at the Fed, and we're all curious to know what the biggest risk from QT is going to be for markets. Yeah, look, I, I think what people need to remember is, you know, the Fed is using two tools. One is the Fed funds rate, which is the cost of capital. Uh, and, you know, running off the balance sheet is the amount of capital. Uh, and I think, you know, as we've been trying to caution clients about, uh, it's where that quantity of capital and quantity of liquidity has been most beneficial that its withdrawal is gonna to continue to be felt. And that is in the, the most speculative parts of the market, the most richly valued parts of the market. Uh, so while I think we've seen a bounce uh, back over the last um, you know, five or seven trading days uh, in some of those sectors, whether, whether it's unprofitable tech, if you will, whether it's you know, some strengthening in, in some of this, the smaller cap sectors or sectors uh, you know, levered to, um, uh, you know, some of the more speculative parts of the market. Uh, that's, I think, where we're going to see this withdrawal of liquidity mm -hmm. uh, really start to bite. So, Lisa, I, I guess I wonder how much of that is already in the market. And, I, and I'm just looking at the front end of the curve now, whether you're looking here or in Canada, for example. The Bank of Canada hikes 50 bips. They say we can do more if, if we need to. We kind of knew that was going to happen. But the market reacts quite strongly anyway. What's appropriately priced? So look, I think we need to remember, you know, from our perspective, what's happening on the front end of the curve is all about, you know, what uh, people think is going to happen to rates. Uh, what happens on the back end of the curve is very much about what people think is going to happen to the balance sheet. Uh, and so I think, you know, we saw, you know, a pullback in the 10 year uh, and the 30 year over the last, um, you know, kind of three or four weeks. Uh, and our sense is we may give some of that uh, rally in, in long duration treasuries back as people begin to further internalize uh, what this withdrawal of, uh, of liquidity looks like uh, for that longer duration bid. Mm, so that's the longer term story. And, and, and as you say, that might be driven by, by the balance sheet. Let me ask you what you expect to hear next from the Federal Reserve. I mean, we just went through some data on the US economy, the data suggesting, according to our colleagues on the Markets Live blog, that the economy can handle a hawkish Fed. For how much longer do we hear a hawkish Fed, Lisa? Do you have any kind of pivot point in mind? I think the Fed's going to remain extraordinarily hawkish through September. Uh, but I do think that September is going to be a, a watershed, and it's going to be a watershed in terms of the deceleration of Fed hawkishness, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's think about it. We're going to, you know, live through uh, what's likely to be uh, 50 basis points in June, 50 basis points uh, in July, potentially, uh, you know, 50 in August as we get closer and closer to, you know, Fed funds futures forecast for this for the full year. And at the same time, that quantitative tightening is ramping up uh, and we don't get to steady state uh, on those things until September. So I think by the time we get to September, uh, we should have some more constructive inflation data the, that will give the Fed some cover. Uh, we'll also be approaching uh, the uh, midterm election season mm -hmm. when the Fed typically, uh, uh, in their spirit of independence, wants to try to quiet down uh, and not get into the fray of campaign season. So I, I, we're targeting September for a, a, a shift in the tone from the Fed, but it's going to be a rocky summer uh, from where we, we sit, uh, and the Fed's going to keep their foot on the accelerator. So, Lisa... I, this is such a simplistic question, but like, what do you buy and what do you sell on that? In, in, in that, if you're if we're in for a higher volatility regime until things calm down, what do you what, what do you do with that? We haven't been in that kind of regime in in a very very long time. Yeah. So our advice to clients has been uh, to be a uh, very active uh, asset allocator and be a very active uh, security selector. 
Uh, we're advising, you know, maximum levels of diversification by region, by sector, by exposure to style and quality factors, by by capitalization, uh, and we're really just hollowing out uh, the parts of the uh, of our uh, portfolio exposure that's very sensitive to uh, rates, uh, and so that has left us surprisingly. Uh, very focused on uh, on a, a suite of cyclical oriented uh, sectors like energy, like industrials, like financials, uh, like some consumer services, and balancing that with some more defensive uh, um, exposures, most particularly mm. healthcare. Okay, so that combination of the cyclical and the defensives. On the subject of that cyclical, you mentioned commodities, you mentioned oil. Is that still a good place to hide, Lisa? Do you think we've seen peak oil? I mean, clearly the geopolitics, very difficult to call here, but you have the geopolitics pushing the supply side, but then you have the demand side from China. Where do you think this heads? I, I think we go higher before, uh, you know, we get to a resolution around equilibrium. Uh, clearly, um, you know, we've gone through this period where much of... Uh, the pressure has, quite frankly, come from the constrained supply side and what's going on emanating from the Russia-Ukraine war. But what we have to appreciate exactly to your point uh, is that China and, quite frankly, a, a swath of emerging markets have been, uh, if not slowing, close to uh, a recession. And so as those economies come back, which, again, we have very high degree of confidence they will, uh, towards the third and fourth quarter of this year, in large part because we do think uh, that China is going to aggressively stimulate into uh, the next Communist uh, mm -hmm. Congress in September when Xi uh, goes for a historic uh, next term. Uh, and so, you know, if we see a spike in demand, um, you know, in the back half of the year, I don't think that the supply situation globally is going to be fixed by then. Mm -hmm. And so, we're looking at at least another six to 12 months, um, in our humble opinion, uh, of, of tightness in oil markets here. And so that, that trade's got more, more ways to run. Hey, Lisa, it was really good to catch up with you. Thank you so much, Lisa Shallot, Morgan Stanley Wealth Management Chief Investment Officer. Uh, coming up, I was wrong. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen admitting she made a major misjudgment when it came to inflation. More from Washington next. Um, and just to point out here, we're seeing a little bit of a risk-off mood underway. The S&P is now down by about four-tenths of one percent. Dollar moving higher, yields moving higher. That really uh, took effect when the Bank of Canada came out with that 50 basis point uh, rate hike and warned of for further more to come and that good data from the U.S. We're seeing a little bit of risk repricing here uh, as we head into the session. Also want to point out that Jamie Dimon, CEO of J.P. Morgan, is speaking at the Autonomous Strategic Decisions Conference right now. Some really interesting headlines coming out saying, um, on the economy, it's a hurricane. I thought it was a storm before, but now it's a hurricane, and that you better <laughs> brace yourself. I don't quite know what that means, but he is definitely warning of tightening conditions and private borrowers and saying that you should brace yourself on the U.S. economy. We'll continue to update you on some of those headlines as they cross. This is Bloomberg. Real chart. If, if I have to hold twice as much capital as somebody else, then somebody else should own the loan. Now, I may not be able to do it overnight. You're damn straight I'm going to do it over time. I think I was wrong then about um, the path that inflation um, would take. As I mentioned, there have been unanticipated and large shocks to the economy that have boosted uh, energy and food prices. It is not something that you hear every day from a Treasury Secretary. For more on Janet Yellen's surprising remarks, want to go to Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hardern joining us in Washington. Anne-Marie, this is all sort of the White House's push to start controlling the economic narrative, right? I feel like there was a flood of officials over the last 24 hours trying to place the blame and trying to do mea culpas. Yeah, there is definitely going to be a concerted effort for the month of June. There seems to be a lot of angst within the administration, according to this NBC report, that uh, pre the president hasn't exactly liked how the communications have gone regarding a lot of these issues. And when you look at inflation and some of the recent polls, one uh, earlier this month was that more than 9 in 10 Americans think at a minimum inflation is a huge concern and they don't like the way the administration is handling it. So you're going to see a lot of communication from this administration. Yesterday we heard from Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, a mea culpa, saying 
maybe we got this wrong or we did get it wrong in terms of the path forward for what we thought inflation or how high inflation would get. But there is an issue in the sense that the administration says that they are doing everything they can. But then when you ask them questions like, well, where are you on the China tariffs, for instance, something that has been, um, you know, dealt with potentially as a means to shave off some level of inflation, they don't have answers yet. So this is going to be a month where I think there's going to be a lot of questions of the administration if they're serious about doing anything to bring down inflation. What exactly are those actions? Because right now, a lot of it is is rhetoric. It was a photo op with mm. Jay Powell. We've had two op-eds, and it's been a slew of uh, officials on television networks, as you pointed out, Alex. Anne-Marie, good morning to you. So uh, what are we hearing from uh, President Biden then? Or give us the context, I suppose, because in, in international financial markets, we like to talk all the time about what the Fed is doing and the Fed's role in fighting right. inflation and the independence of the Fed. But I imagine that's not necessarily how Main Street sees it in the US, or at least they need re maybe reminding by politicians that there are others responsible for fighting inflation too. That's a great point, Anna. And actually, Guy and Alex asked this to me yesterday. How many people in America know who Jay Powell is? And I didn't know. But I looked back at a poll in 2014 when Treasury Sec current Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen was the Fed chair. She was named Forbes' most powerful women, and yet only 24% of Americans, when asked who she was, knew who she was. 24%. So this moment with the president standing next to Fed Chair Jay Powell, who just got his second um, re, uh, second uh, confirmation from the Senate to be the helm of the Fed, is really the president saying, passing the buck a little bit, this is the Fed's responsibility. They are responsible for the unemployment rate, and they're also responsible for consumer prices. This is something that, as you say, a lot of everyday individuals need to be reminded of because when you see gasoline, another record today, $4.67 going up, when you see your groceries going up, you, you blame the individual sitting in the Oval Office. You don't necessarily mm. think of the Fed chair. <laughs> yeah, so the emphasis may be from Powell on the independence, but with that independence comes responsibility presenting to Jerome Powell. Amory, thank you very much. Bring back Sir Amory Horden outside the White House, of course, for us. Coming up on this program, we're talking markets and bargains in a time of inflation. Our exclusive interview with the co-chairman of Oak Tree Capital, Howard Marks. He sat down with uh, our colleagues at Bloomberg TV to talk about these markets. More detail from Howard Marks coming up shortly. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> an hour into the U.S. trading session, we got a pretty strong ISM manufacturing number. Demand really holding up quite well. Now, that actually spurred a little bit of a risk-off move. You have yields on the front end surging higher. Dollar on the highs of the session. Stocks uh, drop into session lows. Let's dig beneath that a little bit now with Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Abigail? Well, Alex, that's a great setup because it's really interesting to see this because, of course, on the open, we had stocks higher, but right now that S&P 500 down about six-tenths of one percent, the Nasdaq down three-tenths of one percent, having everything to do with that ISM number coming in stronger than expected, uh, perhaps it means that the Fed's fully on course. They, of course, floated the idea of having flexibility later this year, but if the economy is okay and does not need help, it could maybe uh, create the path to continue raising if needed. In any case, we have some more volatility for stocks. Crude is up 1.6 percent. This, of course, on the possibility the report that OPEC Plus may consider dropping the plus and exempt Russia from its targets. There's also super tight inventories. So we have crude oil at 116. And to Alex's point, take a look at that two-year yield backing up 10 to 11 basis points. So right now, an interesting day here with uh, stocks down, bonds down, and crude oil higher. Now, what is also lower is uh, the housing market in terms of uh, the number of um, uh, the mortgage rate here for the uh, the applications, excuse me, for mortgages, not surprisingly, in the bottom panel here, uh, down for a third week in a row. This as the 30-year average rate for mortgages. It's been trending off of the high, but nonetheless, it's ticked back up just a little bit. 
So that, of course, created uh, a little bit of an issue for the home builder sector. As for sectors on the day, the energy sector up 1.2% in line with oil trading higher. We also have software and services higher up about six tenths of 1%. This after CRM, Salesforce.com put up a great outlook saying that business demand uh, for enterprise software is still very, very strong. And that stock itself up more than 10%, helping out that sector. Communication sector uh, services up a little bit at this point. And then we see airlines. This is an interesting turnaround because earlier, uh, airlines had been sharply higher, now down 3.5%, maybe having something to do with the oil. But we do, of course, know, Anna, uh, that uh, Delta Airlines joined both United Airlines and Southwest in terms of reiterating and raising the revenue guide because demand remains strong. But the airline sector uh, not following mm -hmm. along right now. We'll be digging into that. Yeah, aviation under pressure today here in Europe as well. A, a tough week, one where European aviation businesses were hoping to make quite a bit of money with lots of vacations taking place certainly here in the UK. But uh, it's proving difficult to get up to speed, to get up to capacity for those aviation businesses. Thanks to Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle with a look at the markets there. Now, Howard Marks thinks it's a good time to be a value investor. Marks is the co-founder of Oak Tree Capital Management, the largest investor in distressed securities worldwide. He spoke with Bloomberg in an exclusive interview. Attitudes are more balanced today, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, when, when there's euphoria, when there's optimism, when there's greed, when there's risk tolerance and so forth, uh, that's a very difficult climate for the value investor uh, to find uh, bargains. Uh, so uh, we're happier today than we were six months ago. I don't know if we're going to be happier six months from now. That is to say that the bargains will be more pronounced. But at least, the, as they say, the bloom is off the rose. At a time of such incredible uncertainty, how do you position seeing value now, but also preparing for seeing more value in six months? You know, uh, one of the six tenets of Oak Tree's investment philosophy, which we established when we started in April of 95, and I've never changed the word, and I believe in thoroughly, is that uh, we're not market timers. And, and, and that means mostly two things. We never sell to raise cash to, to prepare for a decline. Uh, and we never say it's cheap today, but it'll be cheaper in six months, so we'll wait. If it's cheap today, we buy it. If it's cheaper in six months more, we buy more. Uh, and I think that that works much better than an assertion that we know where the market will be in six months. This is really important at a time when so many pensions and institutional investors have been shooting for that 75 to 8% bogey. We talked about that extensively in the past five to six years. This idea that that seemed completely unachievable in an era of quantitative easing. Suddenly, high-yield bonds have an average yield of more than 7%. Is this the best period that you have seen for pensions to actually hit their bogeys for more than a decade? Uh, well, I think that's right. In, 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 uh, well, of course, many have hit their bogeys. Uh, it just didn't look in advance like they would, but the stock market and many other things have surprised on the upside for the last 10 years. Um, but now, uh, as you point out, one of our big activities is high yield bonds. And uh, a year ago, they were yielding in the threes of percent. Uh, one deal was even done in the twos. That's not a very high yield for high yield. Today, as you say, they yield in the sevens. So a pension fund that needs seven or seven and a half can make use of high yield bonds. And everything, you know, see, when everybody gets concerned when prices decline. But if you flip that over, the flip side of price deterioration is increases in prospective returns. So now the prospective returns are on many asset classes are higher than they were just a little while ago. And uh, again, a much better climate for the bargain hunter. Some people would counter this by saying inflation takes a lot of the value out of those returns, that basically on a real basis you're still not getting very much. How do you counter that as a long-term investor by saying, you know what, at this point it's worth it to get higher returns even if on a real basis it's not necessarily that much more? Well, you're right in that uh, we're not talking about an increase in real returns. We're increase, talking about an increase in nominal returns. Most, most pension funds and other uh, uh, organizations reckon their need for return in nominal terms. Uh, but, um, you know, I mean, th that is a challenge. Uh, and uh, w nobody knows what inflation is going to do. Uh, I think I heard out of one ear your previous uh, guest 
say that uh, you know some of the inflation factors will probably subside in the next few months, which means uh, all things being equal, uh, an increase in real returns. That was Howard Marks, Oak Tree Capital co-chairman, earlier today on Bloomberg Television. All right, coming up, the political climate in Latin America and how it is affecting investments. We're going to speak with private equity investor Oscar DiCatelli, DXA Invest CEO, coming up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Rishka Gupta. You're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Quincy Crosby, the Prudential Financial Chief Market Strategist on Bloomberg TV, 3.30 p.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. I'm Rishka Gupta. Ukraine will get advanced rocket systems and other weapons from the U.S. President Biden made the announcement in an article published in the New York Times. The rockets will allow Ukraine to hit targets up to 50 miles away. The U.S. says Ukraine has promised not to attack targets inside Russia. In New York State, Governor Kathy Hochul and legislative leaders pledged to raise the legal age to purchase an AR-15 assault rifle to 21 years old from 18. They also say they'll pass a package of measures to tighten gun laws this week. Officials cited the recent mass shootings in Uvalde, Texas and Buffalo. In Colombia, the peso rallied after construction mogul Rodolfo Hernandez defied the polls to secure a place in the election runoff later this month. That reduces the chance that leftist Senator Gustavo Petro will be the next president. Hernandez is something of an unknown, but he is seen as a safer bet for business interests. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. All right, thanks so much, Ritika. Let's stay in Latin America for a moment. So we have that election uncertainty in Colombia. Uh, Brazil has a presidential election in October, where former President De Silva, the leftist, is really looking to stage quite a comeback. And on the economic front, Latin American economies are dealing with high inflation and high U.S. dollar and questions about the strength of the consumer, just like everywhere else. Mm -hmm. So joining us now to discuss investments in Latin America is Oscar Dicotelli, a DXA Invest CEO and founder, joining me here on set. Oscar, it's a pleasure. Nice yeah, to see you. Yeah, it's great to see you again, Alex, and Perth. It's been a long time since I've been here in New York. It so. has been quite a long yeah. time. I, I got your name right, and that feels like a huge <laughs> his name is one I couldn't say forever. Um, so the climate from where you sit, you invest in private equity, you, yeah. um, mid, small uh, companies, mostly geared towards the consumer. Um, where are you right now? Well, Alex, I think it's what's going on is really kind of an example that it's not about macro, right? So we're seeing a lot of bad information on the macro side that you were mentioning, inflation, the slow growth, and even on the election side, there's a lot of discussions to happen there. But when you look in terms of the underlying companies, venture-related, tech-enabled companies, innovation-related, it's, it's, a, it's a new market. It's a different setup. We just saw, for instance, in Colombia, we just saw last month a new unicorn coming out of Colombia with international big funds investing and backing that company, just to give an example. But do you need, so we're talking like those technology exposed to the consumer and then do you need a strong consumer? Do you need the macro to hold up for that to continue to happen? Not necessarily. I'll give an example. So when you think about Latin America from a macro standpoint, it would say there's no security, there's political instability, there's poverty. And when you look from a couple of different companies, they're resolving those problems. So I always say about Uber, right, because there's no security there. The three best cities for Uber in, are in Latin America. Mexico City, Sao Paulo and Rio are the biggest number in terms of Number of rides. And you say there's political instability and there are companies that are doing, for instance, uh, cameras, surveillance cameras that they're using to pile up that information to resolve something that the government's not doing. So I think that the fact that you have big problems are now, now becoming more and more a big market and landscape for you to be able to tap into that mm. with technology. Oscar, good to see you. So, so security becomes a business opportunity there where governments are absent, then private business can, can, can make some money. Let me ask you about, though, some of the macro themes and how they do impact the kind of private equity deals that, that you're doing. Because, I mean, the Fed, the Fed, with its tighter policy, private equity has been a big winner, of course, from low interest rates, a lot of money allocated in that direction. Is it harder? Is, is money harder to come by now? 
Look, I think, of course, money is a little bit harder than what we saw in the past. We're still seeing uh, massive drives of growth in terms of the volumes that are coming into the region. So I'll give an example. If you take a percentage of uh, tech-enabled companies versus GDP, Brazil and LATAM is about 2%, okay? India is at 14%, China 40%, and, and the U.S. 70%. So there's still a long way to go there. So you're coming from such a low base that it's not impacting that much. However, we are seeing, especially in the deals that we're doing, the uh, uh, when you start putting interest rates into that deal. So you do things like a debt that has an interest and it converts on the next round. And you're starting to see things, well, especially in Brazil, that now interest rates are at 12 and three quarters, you have to factor that in, into your deal. So I think it, that uh, funds and investors that can be kind of a little bit more flexible and definitely the companies are open to that, you're able to factor in the interest into those negotiations. Um, so tell me about maybe the most recent deal that you did and then maybe one area that you're most excited about. So uh, we, we do have a, a strong view in terms of consumer uh, kind of uh, changes, right? We've just done a deal in a beauty tech. It's a company that started off basically, it's called Beauty for All. Basically, they started giving kind of small kits that people that would kind of pay on a monthly subscription side, right, to have the newest uh, uh, lipstick. And then that's, that drove into a economy for second income. So now these creators and influencers, they buy these subscriptions, but they, bought, they set up their uh, online shops and then use the internet to drive that. So when you got into a situation where income is not very well and everything, you started to have bigger subscribers because people were looking to use that as a way for a second income. And now they have about 100,000 subscribers on a monthly standpoint and a million people that really kind of run that network. So I think mm. there's a lot of different things that are happening in the landscape. And it's not just Brazil, it's Colombia, it's Mexico, all across Latin America that we're seeing these kind of opportunities. Uh, okay, some sub subscription models then of interest to you, Oscar. Uh, let me ask you about clean tech. We're going to talk later this hour about electric vehicles and expectations for, for, for their future development. But around clean tech, are you finding I interesting ideas on that theme, Oscar? For sure, for sure, Anna. Uh, well, first of all, we're seeing a huge uh, impact of investments towards solar, towards uh, uh, wind energy also, especially in Brazil. There's some new legislations around it. We're looking a lot at clean tech, for instance. You have companies that use uh, 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 technology for you to reduce the, the expenditures around, for instance, private planes. This is a deal that we're currently looking at, for instance, where you have like a net jets here, just to give an example. Similar situations that are using there also. These are definitely drivers of clean tech movement. Brazil already has, specifically Brazil, already has one of the cleanest matrix of energy in the world. And I think that we're seeing now these big investments towards solar and wind, they're de definitely going to drive like the big change. Just give one example. In the northeast of Brazil, the factor, uh, the load factor for wind is about 65% efficiency. Mm -hmm. You look in the Nordics, it's 40% uh, efficiency. Mm -hmm. And now they just uh, issued a law where they're going to allow for you to have offshore wind uh, turbines. So uh, this is something that's still at the verge at the beginning. So when you see market volatility like that, it doesn't impact that much because it's coming from such a low base of low, ca low amount of capitals being invested in there. So let's just go macro for just a moment. Yeah, of course. Um, you mentioned uh, the high yield and sort of what, what that winds up doing when you're factoring in your investment and issuing debt. What about inflation? Like how do you look at inflation and then eating into your returns? Like do you just change your profile? Well, I think you do need to factor in specific products that you're investing in that will use inflation as an aspect. So if it's uh, gasoline prices that's going to generate an impact into that company, you should be shying away. We are doing that, of course. But I do think that uh, macro will impact, from a political standpoint, will impact the landscape of innovation being driven. So we've seen a lot of new legislations to allow fintech to, to operate freely. We're looking at things around health tech to, to, to be freely. If we do have the impact of inflation affecting the, the political landscape and then you see a, 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 a backdrop of the mentality towards a pro-business region, then that's, I think, it's something that becomes a bit more risky. Oscar, let me ask you that about pro-business and how pro-business some of these uh, geographies are. We started our conversation talking about Colombia, where somebody who is relatively pro-business and pro-risk assets uh, is now going to be in the runoffs. Uh, and, and maybe that was a surprise to some people. Are there 
geographies, countries where you feel you have a more pro-business backdrop or are you saying the opportunities don't really correlate with that? Well, I think it's quite interesting. What happened in Colombia, for instance, is, is, is a discussion with Hernandez coming uh, uh, from, uh, uh, now into the, second, uh, into the second round is really showing that the population, they want to change. They want to see, don't want to see the old, old politicians in power, right? We saw that in 2018 in Brazil when Bolsonaro came in, into power. Although he was a longtime politician, was, wasn't somebody that was really kind of on, on people's mind, right? So I think what's, what we're seeing in Colombia also is uh, the, the, especially the younger population that was really kind of connected to Hernandez with TikTok, like they call it TikTok King, right? Huh. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we saw that this is the same population that wants more innovation, wants more products. So I think that Colombia has a great, uh, a great setup for the future. Uh, Brazil has it, Mexico has it also. Even in some stances, we're seeing a lot of interesting uh, uh, opportunities that come out of even Argentina. That's in such a difficult moment, but it's through innovation and technology that we're starting to see companies that are kind of resolving those issues for the general public. Oscar, it's really good to catch up with you. Yeah, really appreciate great. seeing you in person. Oscar DiCatelli, DXA Invest CEO and founder. Thank you so very much. All right, coming up, electric vehicle sales are expected to soar in the next few years. We got a new report from Bloomberg that says that's not enough to get to carbon neutrality. More details on that next. This is Bloomberg. It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash, a look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Ritika Gupta. Shares of Salesforce are rising today. The company raised its annual profit forecast, a signal that demand for business software is holding up despite a broader downturn for those major tech firms. Salesforce co-CEO Mark Benioff says that so far the demand environment remains strong. The richest person in the world doesn't appear to think much of working from home. Elon Musk apparently sent an email to the executive staff at Tesla with the subject line, remote work is no longer acceptable. He wrote that anyone who wishes to do remote work must be in the office for a minimum of 40 hours per week or leave Tesla. And that is your latest Business Flash. Anna? Ritika, thank you very much. Ritika with the business flash. Now, staying with electric vehicles, she was just talking about Tesla there. A new report predicts that EV sales are set to more than triple by 2025. But it says governments and car makers need to lean even harder into eliminating emissions. That report comes from Bloomberg NEF, BNEF, uh, New Energy Finance. With us now is Ryan Fisher, Bloomberg NEF analyst for electrified transport. The perfect person to speak to you then about this report. Ryan, really good to speak to you. So what is the, what's the big takeaway coming through from this report then? Yeah, so as we hear in the news, we're selling more and more EVs. I mean, last year, a lot of the top markets, China, Germany, getting 15, 25% of car sales being EV. So it certainly is a success story. But when you even look at that and you project out to the future, we're still in a position where we're not meeting net zero by 2050. It's really difficult to get rid of those internal combustion engine vehicles from the fleet. So we end up with somewhere around a third of the fleet still being um, internal combustion engine. And that's even worse when you think about heavy duty um, vehicles. So we end up with something like a third of the fleet um, being zero emission by 2050 in that case. But that still means you've got many of those on the road yeah. and they're obviously high emitters. And so does that mean that people aren't demanding EVs or they're just not available, not as easy to access, they're not as available to buy and maybe they're, you know, the, the combustion engine ones are cheaper still? Yeah, so I think price has something to do with it, but I don't think it's all the way there. So um, we've obviously seen EVs get problems in the supply crunch, semiconductor crisis, not being able to produce them. Uh, but one thing that I think is understated at the moment is whilst the price, when you, you look at it, first of all, looks expensive, you've then got subsidies can be $7,000, say, in Germany. Mm. Um, but then you're starting to see TCO and, and fuel costs actually be much lower. So whilst electricity prices have gone up, gas prices have gone up quicker. So an EV can actually be somewhere around $1,500 cheaper okay. per year. Alex. Um, hey, Ryan, um, first of all, I should point out that your work is referenced among all Wall Street analysts when it comes to EVs, whether it's the equities or whether it's the commodities. So kudos to the work. Um, quickly, do you feel, when is the adoption rate going to happen? Like, when, when is it going to flip uh, in terms of an EV becoming cheaper than an internal combustion engine? Have you revised that? 
Um, so what we started to see was in uh, kind of looking around 23, 24, depending on the region, depending on exactly the size of the vehicle. And obviously battery prices have slightly um, in increased. We see that in the news every day, um, which, which means that it might be a little bit more challenging. It might push it further back. But as I just kind of um, said a second ago, what we're also seeing is people start to look and go, actually, I can use cheap electricity in the evening, and therefore um, my fuel costs are much less than yeah. paying and going to the gas station. Um, so two slightly different conversations there. OK, Ryan, thanks very much. Thanks for the analysis. Ryan Fisher of uh, Bloomberg NEF joining us with the latest on the rise of electric vehicles. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.